And the countdown has started. Oh, hi everyone. My name is Cullen Gallagher and I'm helping out with this year's NoirCon. And it is my extreme pleasure to be able to introduce Blue Collar Noir, Bald Fists, Clenched Teeth, and Dark Turns in Men's Adventure Magazines. Uh, I'm very happy to have with us today publishers, editors, and historians Wyatt Doyle and Bob Dice. And they're going to discuss the history of these fantastic publications, as well as their own Men's Adventure Library series, which explores vintage pulp fiction, art, and history. Wyatt Doyle, uh, among many things, is the ringmaster of New Texture, and he edits and designs most of the releases himself. He is also the author of many books, including Stop Requested, illustrated by Stanley Zappa, photography books such as Dollar Halloween and Jorge Amaya Doesn't Live Here Anymore, and the co-screenwriter of Devil May Call. Uh, Bob Dice uh, owns one of the world's largest collections of vintage men's adventure magazines. In 2009, he created an outstanding resource about the genre menspulpmags.com. And he also writes two blogs about famous quotations, this day in quotes.com and quote counterquote.com. Um, these are just a few of the incredible books that they've put together and they are, um, the interior design is just so lovely. Like the paper quality, um, there, there's such, um, such, you know, such care. Anybody that's looking to buy them, they are available through Farley's Bookstore, uh, which is the official bookstore for NoirCon. Um, they're a fantastic independent operation and were just purchased by the employees. So I'm very th thrilled for them. Some of the titles, um, which they'll be discussing today, uh, I Watched Them Eat Me Alive, Weasels Ripped, ripped My F Flesh, He-Men, Bagman, and Nemphos, and cryptozoology. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Bob and Wyatt, and I will come back uh, for a Q&A. So if you have any questions, uh, type them into the chat, and we will get to them all. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Colin. Uh, so I'm Wyatt Doyle, and it's my collaborator, Bob Dice. We collaborate uh, on the Meds Adventure Library, as Colin mentioned. Um, it's a series of books exploring the history of men's adventure magazine fiction and illustration art. Um, men's adventure magazines, or, or MAMS for short, are our area of expertise. Uh, they're a vital, if forgotten, part of a continuum in 20th century action adventure storytelling and publishing. Um, these are formats that are closely interrelated. Uh, the popes of the 20s through the 40s, uh, they delivered thrills and adventure, occasionally pushing existing boundaries of uh, propriety and good taste. Um, and while some recurring pulp characters such as the Shadow and Doc Savage have endured the test of time, uh, that enduring popularity has also confused latecomers who presume all pulps were similar. And this was not the case. Um, in its heyday, pulp wasn't a genre, it was a format and different pulp fiction magazines uh, focused on different interests. In addition to crime, detective, and hero pulps like The Shadow and Doc Savage, there were Western pulps, detective pulps, uh, romance pulps, sports pulps, uh, aerial pulps, you name it, there was a pulp magazine uh, presenting short fiction set in that world. Uh, concurrent with the pulps, the 1940s and uh, 50s saw the emergence of paperback originals, uh, novels that first saw publication as paperbacks. These are inexpensive and often adorned with uh, colorful and exciting painted cover art. Um, paperbacks were a major development, and uh, they proved an, an able complement uh, to both pulps and a new format that emerged in the late 40s, early 1950s. This was a, a hybrid format whose contents were a combination of elements targeting American men. Uh, these were men's adventure magazines, or MAMs for short, and they tended to include a little of everything that was thought to appeal to American males. Um, readers responded to the intensity and lack of pretense that all three formats shared. And while there are clear differences in the approaches of each and further distinctions arise when exploring individual publishers and publications, a common current ran through them all. That was brass tacks, aggressively action-focused writing. Thrills for the sake of thrills with uh, no loftier purpose, 
authors did not waste time getting to the good stuff. And the good stuff could be bigger than life and wild. Um, these formats and their unpretentious meat and potatoes writing were, were literary fast food, uh, junk food to the snobs and blue noses uh, who dismissed them. But these were post-war years, and a sizable portion of the male population had served in World War II and were continuing to process their own experiences there. So consciously and unconsciously, this influenced MAMS and the kind of stories that they published. Uh, let's take a look at uh, some MAM covers. I can make this work. They started early. I'm on now. Bear with me. Uh, da, da, da. Share my screen. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what you're going to see in this slideshow are MAM covers by George Gross. He's an illustration artist whose career straddles the three formats I mentioned. Uh, he began as a cover artist for the classic pulps, went on to do some sterling work in MAMs, while concurrently working as a paperback cover artist, uh, a format he continued to work in after the MAMs unfolded. And uh, these covers are included in our uh, latest Men's Adventure Library release, George Gross Covered. Um, so, Bob, can you explain what exactly were MAMs? And what set them apart from, from the pulps? Yeah, actually, they're sort of an out, outgrowth of the earlier pulp magazines. And in, in fact, three of the top pulp magazines from the early, that started out in early 1900s, uh, uh, Argosy, Adventure, and Blue Book, um, the long-running long pulps, around World War II and the years after that, they started to morph into men's adventure magazines. And what, what they did was they, they incorporated elements from the pulp magazines, the painted covers, action adventure story, fiction stories, um, but they also started to incorporate uh, elements from other types of magazines that men were reading at the time, um, like true crime magazines, girly magazines with, uh, you know, uh, glamour girl photos. They weren't nude. They weren't Playboy style photos yet. They were glamour girl photos with scantily clad women. Uh, there were a lot of those on the stands in, in the late 40s, early 50s. Um, and there were uh, detective magazines. There were also scandal rags like Confidential. Um, and men's adventure magazines starting in the late 40s, early 50s, started to incorporate these various kinds of stories into uh, a genre that would appeal primarily. They started out trying to appeal primarily to World War II veterans, which was, you know, there were millions of them, 13 million uh, men served in World War II, um, and they had grown up on reading pulp magazines and comic books. Um, uh, but after the war, uh, they were looking for something new and different, and men's adventure magazines started to fill that niche. Uh, and they, uh, in, in, unlike the pulps, which pretty much had line drawings as illustrations. One of the uh, innovations of men's adventure magazines was to not only have great painted covers, but also have really high quality interior illustrations done by some of the top illustration artists of the day. And they were uh, often printed in, some, in full color in some magazines, uh, but more commonly they were duotone, duotone illustrations inside, meaning one color in black and white, or sometimes they were just black and white. Um, and the kinds of stories that they had um, provided uh, escapism. It was uh, it was it was male fantasy escapism. Um, with I mean, they're, and, I'm sorry. I mean, their perhaps, whole approach to to fiction, uh, at, at least the darker fiction, which is what we're concerning ourselves with in this talk today. I mean, there's just such a variety of, of fiction and a variety of approaches, but 
the stuff that um that we're focusing on i mean it drew it definitely drew inspiration from some of the classic pulp genres and it would emphasize the extremity um the man fiction could be violent sexy and over the top both in the subject matter the approaches and as you mentioned i mean something that's absolutely essential to a great man is illustration art so everything was bigger and wilder you know realism be damned um and of course, part of the reason Mams leaned so heavily on illustration art is that photographs simply could not adequately capture what a talented illustrator could. So both Mam writers and illustration artists uh, would continue to up this ante as the decades progressed. And that embrace of excess and outrageousness became a defining aspect of the magazines. I mean, it's, it's, it's why those who read them read them and why those who turned their noses up dismissed them. Um, but owing to their to not only uh, their willingness but their eagerness to take the low road to newsstand success, um, Mams developed a reputation as something somewhat seedy and lowbrow entertainment. It was it was kept they were kept at arm's length from more respectable diversions. But the interest in intense uh, adult fiction that skipped to the good parts and emphasized the extreme. Uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, found enthusiastic readers. And again, paired with that dark, fatalist tone uh, that so many deployed, um, it led to, to Mams rapidly becoming a, a publishing phenomenon. Now, Bob, can you, can you address some of the, the, the varieties of Mams? I mean, the, the, number, the sheer number published and, and also your tier system. Yeah, one of the... One of the things about men's adventure magazines, which is also true of, of the earlier pulp magazines, that's it, it's not easy to make too many generalizations about them. There were uh, between the late '40s and the late '70s more than 150 different men's adventure magazine titles um, put out by you know, more than a dozen different publishers, and uh, each one of the publishers sort of had their own vision for men's adventure magazine individual magazine title was was somewhat different than others um and and so you ha you had on the at the top we, we why and i kind of arbitrarily made a three-tier system based on both um readership and quality and what we call the top tier are magazines that had hundreds of thousands and sometimes in some years uh, a million or more readers, and that included uh, Argosy after it became a men's adventure magazine, morphed from a pulp into a, ma a ma'am, um, Cavalier, True, uh, Climax, Saga, and there were a couple of other magazines that, we, that would had very high readership, uh, Man's Magazine and Challenge for Men. Those were all put out by uh, major publishers who also had paperback arms. Um, uh, Cavalier and True were put out by Fawcett, which had Fawcett and gold medal paperbacks. Uh, McFadden Publications published Climax and Saga. They had a lot of paperbacks. Pyramid, of course, was a huge paperback publisher uh, and then put out Man's Magazine and Challenge for Man, uh, Challenge for Men. That, there was sort of a mid-tier of, of magazines of other publishers, um, most of whom had previously published comic books uh, and or paperbacks, uh, and that included um, magazine magazine put out by Man Magazine Management, which was uh, Martin Goodman's uh, umbrella company for a lot of different things. Among other things, you may know Martin Goodman uh, and Magazine Management because that was the birthplace of Marvel Comics. Uh, but Magazine Management, a lot of the, the what you're seeing on the screen right now, uh, many of those are magazine management MAMs, that so-called Atlas Diamond Group, um, Man's Illustrated, Man's Conquest. That's a different company, uh, but each one of these titles sort of had their own characteristics, um, and that's why it's, it's one of the, one of the things that's always been interesting to me when I first started collecting men's adventure magazines um, 
back in the 2000s, early 2000s, is that most people have a dim awareness of them and they and and they think they're all about Nazi covers, it's covers magazines with Nazis doing bad things to scantily clad women. And that's really kind of the lowest tier of men's adventure magazines. Uh, that we call sweat mags, basically. Those magazines tended to have fairly limited distribution, press runs of a uh, hundred thousand or less. Um, the mid-tier magazines, like the magazine management magazines, they had hundreds of thousands of readers and they could pay more for the artwork, more for the stories. So the types of stories you would find in the mid-tier and top-tier magazines were more generally better, quote unquote, than those in the in the low tier magazines, the sweat mags that did have stories about Nazis doing terrible things uh, to scanty clad women. Although I will point out, they didn't glorify Nazis. The Nazis and even in those magazines, they were always the bad guys, and they got their usually got their comeuppance in the end of the story. Uh, but oh. Altogether, I would say the, the the biggest thing about men's adventure magazines to me is they all provided escapist reading entertainment for for men who were generally um, working class men or men in, in in rural areas, most of whom were veterans. And they also those magazines were sold at PX stores, so uh, that was one of their biggest outlets. Um, and so active duty men who were in the military were big readers too. And of course, you've probably heard, you would often find them in the, especially in the fifties uh, in barbershops. So you hear many stories of, of folks who said, ah, I saw those in the barbershops back in the day. So you've got, as you said, over 150 different titles from dozens of different publishers. And things were going pretty great guns. What what happened to them? I mean, what 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 led to the to the fall of MAMS and their their eventual disappearance from the newsstands? Basically, society moved on, and and men's adventure magazines just weren't they weren't hip enough anymore for men in the seventies and eighties because they didn't have at least up until then they didn't have uh, nude photos like Playboy. They didn't have stories by uh, the latest hip writers and so forth. Um, and so the reading audience and male readers of magazines shifted more and more toward the Playboy mag genre and, and its clones and, and even harder core uh, porn mags and so forth. That became a bigger uh, those bit tended to get bigger readership starting in the mid seventies and into the eighties than men's adventure magazines and men's adventure magazines. They tried to, to adapt to that. They actually starting in the late sixties, they started having uh, photos of topless women and, and by the uh, mid seventies, even some full frontal nudity, but it wasn't enough to, uh, to make them hip. They were also considered sort of politically incorrect, of course, because unlike Playboy and some of the other men's adventure magazines at the time, you know, the readership kept the men's adventure magazines and the editors themselves were more conservative. They, you know, they weren't uh, against the war in Vietnam, for example. Well, Playboy was was running articles, you know, sort of anti-war articles about the war in Vietnam. Men's adventure magazines were running stories that portrayed um, American soldiers and, and, and pilots and, and, and sailors who were active in the war in Vietnam, similar to the way that they were, that World War II uh, soldiers and, and military men were portrayed as people who were doing, you know, who were serving their country and who deserved credit for their bravery and the things that they did. And that was, that was out of sync pretty much with, by the mid seventies, even the early yeah. 70s that was out of sync with the rest of the culture and mm -hmm. even with other men's magazines i mean I, I i i know that's correct i know you're right and i mean i i suspect that they're not as well remembered and celebrated as their 
cousins, the classic pulps and, and vintage paperback. I, I think it has a lot to do with timing, uh, as you're saying. I mean, one might think that that Mams would have benefited from the uh, the nostalgia craze uh, of the late 60s and early 70s. There was a, certainly a revival of interest in pulps and vintage paperbacks in those decades. And of course, this is also the era of Bonnie and Clyde and the great Gatsby on the big screen, uh, influencing decor and fashion, which there was so much give and take among the Mams, uh, what was going on on the big screen, even what was going on on the small screen, what was going on in uh, paperbacks, because the, the whole mission of Mams was just to hook readers, hook male readers. And so as we said at the beginning, the magazines were were a hybrid of anything that they thought would appeal to male readers. Um, so, but uh, even in that era of nostalgia, uh, where again, a renewed interest in old time radio, uh, we even saw some pulps reformatted as mass market paperbacks to great success. Uh, so you have to wonder, well, where were MAMs? And I suspect uh, they were a little, as you say, a little too fresh in the public memory. Um, after all, these were the set in the 70s were the last days of MAMS. So some titles were still on newsstands. And the vintage revival of those years had more to do with that generation's grandparents era of popular culture, where MAMS were more likely viewed as that generation's parents era. Um, so they would have been seen as, as hopelessly square and uh, belonging too much to a culture uh, that a new generation would view uh, as on its way out. So uh, I, I, if MAMs were a little, just a little too close for uh, any kind of ironic distance or or for any sort of flashback appreciation to really take hold. And uh, another, another, yeah. So another difference, I think, you know, you mentioned the paperbacks that started publishing pulp characters like Doc Savage, The Avenger, et cetera. Yeah. Um, difference between pulps and mams were that mams did not have recurring characters pulps you had a lot of different recurring characters that could later be collected into into books men's adventure magazines every issue um and it was fresh there were not it wasn't like a three-part story over three months um it wasn't a recurring character that came back now there were some um book bonus versions of uh, men's adventure novels that appeared in men's adventure magazines on a fairly regular basis, uh, but they weren't really series. And I think that's another thing, another reason why there weren't a lot of reprints of men's adventure magazine stories, except by the publishers. Um, Pyramid, for example, which had lots of paperbacks, regularly published um, uh, anthologies of of stories from man's magazine and challenge for men uh, but that was that was unusual there weren't many like that um, magazine management published a few have some but there weren't a lot of different even in the 50s and 60s there weren't a lot of different anthologies at that point in paperback which, which, I mean, ultimately, I mean, it's it, it, they were passed over. It led to them being passed over for reappraisal while while people were were revisiting all these other areas of the pop of the popular culture and bringing it back to the fore. And I mean, I would say the next generation. All right, so a generation later, which would be my generation, um, I feel like we were primed to embrace vintage mams, but. Accessibility was the problem. Um, MAMs were thin on the ground. Um, the fact that they were that they were created as a disposable uh, entertainment, it meant that few were storing archives of them. I mean, even even old comic books, uh, which so many turned their nose up at in their time, and didn't get a lot of respect. They proved uh, hardier survivors. Um, I've spent hours and hours in thrift stores, used bookshops comic stores, etc. And growing up, I never once encountered a mam in the wild. Um, so it's it's hard for something that's become so inaccessible to uh to 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 get a hold of new readers. I mean how would they how would they even know that uh that mams exist? Um, well you bring up another po interesting point about generations because I'm older uh, than you. I was I was born in 1950 and in the 50s and 60s 
men's adventure magazines were racy enough. They weren't really all that racy compared to Playboy and things that came after that. But kids and teenagers were not, not allowed to read men's adventure magazines. You couldn't go in and, and buy them at the, at the, uh, at the drugstore or, or the newsstand usually if you were, if you were a kid. Um, and your dad, if you had a dad who bought them, you know, he would hide them from you and it would, it would be a treat if you could get them. And then a lot of the stores, they were up on the top shelves. So uh, short young kids couldn't get at them. So kids who grew up in the 50s and 60s didn't really read men's adventure magazines. And so they weren't really primed to be collectors as they got older. That's a great point. Now, now let me ask you this. Let's talk about who made them. Um, who, who, who? We're 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 talking today about man fiction. Um, who was writing this fiction? Who who were these authors? It was a it was a combination. Um, many of the magazines they had a small editorial staff, and they had a, a small handful of writers who were stringers. Uh, that they use regularly, sometimes under their own names, sometimes under pseudonyms. Um, uh, they also publish quote unquote book bonus versions with the basically condensed versions of novels that were popular in the 50s and 60s. Um, and then they, they also took freelance uh, articles and stories from freelance writers of all kinds. There were actually, amazingly, there was a number of famous writers who either had their stories, uh, book bonus versions of their novels or other stories that they wrote reprinted in men's adventure magazines. Um, and there was a number of, of, of writers who started out writing for men's adventure magazines who went on to become famous. Some of the, some of the authors who you may recognize who had stories generally reprinted in men's adventure magazines. Usually they didn't write them for them. Or like Ellery Queen, uh, Brett Halliday, who wrote the Mike Shane books, Bill Pronzini, Evan Hunter, um, Michael Abalone, a uh, very prolific uh, paperback writer, Carter Brown, uh, Day Keen, Richard Stark, who was Donald Westlake, the whole Parker series, many of the most, most of the Parker books, for example, got the book bonus treatment in men's adventure magazines. And just Gil to be clear, Brewer, the book bonuses were were condensed versions of the novel. They weren't the full novel. Right. Reprinted. They were they were sometimes artfully condensed, sometimes not, but or sometimes it was just an excerpt from the novel, not the whole thing. Um, they were both, but they, they didn't run the whole novel over three issues, for example, like the pulp magazines did. They would it would be one piece of the novel or a condensed version of it. And in a, um, just a, a, another sort of uh, example of the interplay, the book bonus, the notion of a book bonus was applied both to excerpts or, or uh, condensations of actual books, but also applied to stories that were not novels and never would be novels, but clearly the the. Um, by pretending that these were novels, I, it's a way that the that Mams were trying to sort of cash in on the popularity of paperbacks, as if saying like, "There's a paperback right in this magazine." Yeah, that was one of the hallmarks of Men's Adventure magazines. Is is it was all often very hard to figure out what was true. They often portrayed stories as true that weren't. They often portrayed stories that were book bonuses from forthcoming novel. Uh, for books that were never published and and stories that are based on forthcoming movies that were never made. <laughs> um, some of the other writers who folks in the noir might recognize, you know, um, Nelson Algren, Norman Mailer, Raymond Chandler, Ed McBain, Richard Prather, Wenzel Brown, Gil Brewer. Um, and then there were also uh, um, oh, Lawrence Block uh, is another one. There were, there were a number of writers who actually started out on the staff of men's adventure magazines, most notably magazine management, uh, Martin Goodman's company. Martin Goodman hired 
uh, Bruce J. Friedman, who became, who went on to become a world famous uh, novelist, playwright, and screenwriter. Um, and, and he had a knack for hiring really good writers as stringers or staff for magazine management magazines, Stag for Men Only, Mail, Men, uh, a number of others. And for example, Ma Bruce hired Mario Puzo when Mario Puzo was still working at a local post office. And Mario became, uh, was on the staff at the magazine Management Mags and wrote scores of stories under the pseudonym Mario Clara. Um, uh, we, there were other writers like uh, Martin Cruz Smith was another one who was, uh, who was hired as a staff writer for the magazine Management Mags. Walter Wager, who wrote a lot of novels that were made into uh, several novels that were made into movies. Um, and then we've got our, our own, our own favorite, uh, Walter Kalin, who was a writer who, who did publish two novels independent of, uh, his men's adventure magazine work, but neither, neither novel really took off. And, and yet he was just an unbelievably versatile talent. He could, he could literally write anything. And he and he did write everything. Um, he was the guy who always made took it. He always turned it up to eleven. And he was the author who, when we would speak to the folks who who worked at the magazines, Walter Kalin's name just kept coming up. He was the guy. He was the guy that they that they particularly Bruce J. Friedman seemed to view as almost a, a almost an archetypical ma'am writer. Um, and of course. Uh, most people would have never, if you didn't pick up a magazine, how would you ever be exposed to his writing? Because as I say, he didn't, didn't have success outside of it. So there were writers whose entire careers uh, were occurred within the, the, the MAM time frame across the, from the fifties, sixties and winding down in the seventies. Yeah. Mario Fuso considered Wal Walter Kalen one of the best too. And he wrote under several pseudonyms. Um, and we, we actually collected some of our favorite Walter Kalin stories in a book uh, gently titled He-Men, Bagmen, and Nymphos, which <laughs> plays off some of the titles of the stories that, uh, that Walter wrote. Now, uh, the other essential component we mentioned earlier was, was the artists. I mean, who, who were our favorites and, and specialties and as well as, uh, as, as what became of them? Um, who, who would you say, who would you say are some of your top, if you're thinking ma'am artists, who do you think of? Well, obviously one of the greats is James Bama, um, and who we, you and I have both talked to him recently, not too recently, but not too long ago, passed away. Um, James Bama went on to become famous for his Western art, but he also was famous for his Doc Savage paperback covers. He did a lot of MAM artwork. Um, Again, those Doc Stan Savage Borat. covers, the pulp reprints coming back as paperbacks. Yeah. Uh, other ones, other artists who did a lot of paperbacks and, uh, and MAM artwork, Stan Borak, Mel Crare, Rudy Nappi, Frank McCarthy, Robert Schultz, uh, Scholes. Um, some of the artists who came in later toward the end of the MAMs are also great uh, in the late 60s, starting uh, artists like uh, Bob Larkin, who is probably best known for his comic book and graphic novel artwork. Uh, Bob did a lot, some great MAM artwork. Oh, other earlier paperback artists like Robert McGuire, um, Robert McGinnis, uh, uh, George Mayers, Ray Johnson, Hal Dodd, Tom Ryan. And the list is very long. Um, John Schoenherr, who did the famous covers for the Dune novels, uh, originally used in analog science fiction magazine. I'd say just about all of the best illustration artists who were, who were still working in the realistic style, many, almost all of them, who weren't who weren't working for Saturday evening post uh, and look and life when they still had uh, cover art 
found outlets uh, for their work in men's adventure magazines. A very long list. Some of the best. One of our favorites, of course, is Samson Pollen. Uh, we've published three books featuring Samson Pollen's men's adventure magazine artwork. And then there's Mort Kunstler, uh, the, who, who is kind of like the godfather of pulp art um, and went on to become both in terms of men's adventure. He was, he'd started and did some pulps, did a lot of men's adventure magazine artwork, mostly for the magazine management company. Um, and then went on to become, you know, the country's most famous historical artist doing civil war and history art, um, movie posters and so forth. Mort has been very nice to us. We've published a book of his men's adventure magazine artwork and there'll be more coming. Uh, but he, he's probably, I guess Mort may be the most prolific and, and, and best of the men's adventure magazine artists, uh, uh, second only to maybe Samson Pollen, Gil Cohen, and a few others uh, in terms of how many he produced and how great And these they guys were. all, they all brought, uh, as with any artist, um, he, they all operated under the direction of uh, magazines, art directors. However, there's still enough of their own style and their own um, areas of expertise uh, emerge to, for example, Samson Pollen, um, particularly strong at depicting action. Um, it, it, there, it's occasionally a criticism of illustration art that um, it doesn't really capture action and motion. It seems more like uh, what it often is, which is people posing in a certain position. But Samson Pollen was somebody who was really became obsessed with the idea of more effectively uh, expressing action and movement and motion in his work to the point where you'd see his his uh, actual style began to loosen up in order to accommodate these kind of, it's hard to call them experiments, but for Sam, they were experiments where he was trying to improve on what had gone before um, and in depicting action. And sometimes that meant that uh, you had to be a little looser in your artwork to have that flexibility to really communicate that. Um, well, well, and of course, we're looking, uh, of course, there's the artist who we're looking at in these slides, George Gross, um, who was one of the greatest, both in the pulp realm, men's adventure magazine realm, and paperbacks. All of these covers you're seeing here are from our latest book, uh, George Gross Cover. And he did a, just fantastic artwork. And one of the things I think you, you'll notice by these scenes, one of the reasons men's adventure magazines kept using painted covers is that while other while other mainstream magazines began using photographs for illustrations and on covers, you could never get these scenes in photographs, okay? These scenes, most of these scenes could only be depicted with art. And so that that that's why a lot of artists continued to have work for men's adventure magazines when they couldn't get it from um, mainstream magazines anymore. They Almost all the mainstream magazines went to photos for covers and interiors in the 60s. Now I'm gonna stop the um, the George Gross slides and I'm gonna take us into a new slideshow for the remainder of the presentation. Um, these are slides that, uh, that emphasize the noir aspects of, of men's adventure magazines. Let's open these boys up. I see uh, in the uh, column on the right of my screen, some people publishing some, some cool men's adventure magazine covers. Nice. Well, I should, I should really swing comments. things in the direction of, of noir now, because uh, if we want to have time for questions and I, I really want to address um, the noir connection, which may be, may be obvious um, based on what we've been talking about, but um, just to put a finer point on it, where, where MAMS and, and Noir really meet. Um, uh, as Bob had mentioned earlier, um, he addressed uh, misperceptions about MAM content and the idea that a little knowledge can be dangerous. Um, for readers who haven't actually read MAMS but think they know them by reputation or 
or maybe are familiar with them from parodies like National Lampoons or uh, parodies or, or similar satirical takes. Um, it's easy to see how uh, from a distance, MAMS could be thought of as emphasizing mock, macho posturing and selling a real rah-rah out of my way, we're number one kind of machismo. But that's not actually what MAMS were. I mean, yes, I mean, as, as we said, they were varied. So there were many tales of scrappy hustlers who finagle their way into fortunes and uh, lighter hearted, exotic adventure stories of castaways made kings on, on all female islands. And, and these kind of adventure fantasies were consistently popular. But when it came to the darker, uh, tougher material, uh, unqualified victories and successes were rare and always came at a high price, usually both physically and psychologically. Um, just to give you a sense of some of the many shared traits uh, with, with great noir, um, this is what you could expect from a typical, uh, from typical men's adventure magazine fiction. Uh, terse, tough writing. Uh, they regularly featured morally ambiguous, corruptible, or out outright corrupt protagonists, um, while many other protagonists begin as innocent bystanders who uh, find themselves caught up in perilous situations they have to fight to survive. Uh, or the use of unreliable narrators, uh, frequent femmes fatales, uh, lethal love triangles, a, a major uh, story uh, point, an emphasis on, on the base sides of human nature. Um, Sex and violence, sex and violence, sex and violence. Um, also an emphasis on the role of fate in storytelling. Um, but, but really it's the darkness, the dark qualities, the, the, the fatalism. That's, that's the key link. And I mean, lots, some of, of, lots of girls and guns in various situations, you know, and, and although some people don't, uh, I don't think are aware of how many of the stories in men's adventure magazines break the mold of the, the Nazis and, and scantily clad women. The truth is the majority of men's adventure magazines, probably 80% didn't use those kinds of covers or those kinds of stories. They were more mainstream style stories, um, action adventure. Yes, but they weren't, they were over the top, but not in the ways of the, uh, like, like you see in the Nazi covers, like somebody's got one up there on the right right now, man's story, you know, with a woman being carried with a pole. You know, that's the that's the lower tier sweat magazines. And, you know, those are kind of fun, too. And 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 we deal with those in some of our books. But I'd say many of the stories in men's adventure magazines that that have a noir flavor uh, are more common and in the in the mid tier and top tier magazines who also use you know book bonus excerpts or book bonus condensations of noir style novels yeah i mean here's uh, here's some of the subjects that you could expect to see in men's adventure magazines and i think the 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 cross the 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 opportunity for for sort of cross pollination with noir attitudes and elements i mean so war stories big one uh, that's big battles, small conflicts uh, on the land, on sea, on air, uh, POW stories, escape stories, um, survival stories. That's wilderness, war, natural disasters, and trouble on high risk uh, and high risk occupations as well. Now, animal attack stories, was, that was a concept that MAMS really took and ran with, and, and arguably the most consistently noir storytelling in MAMS. Um, as we said earlier, I mean, despite outrageous choices of animal adversaries at times, uh, these were always played straight and they often explored dark interior territory as well as detailing uh, savage physical attacks. In, in fact, if I could just interject real quick, yeah. the case in point is Weasels Rip My Flesh, which sounds ridiculous. And, and it's based on a, on a story. Frank Zappa got that title from a uh, September 1956 uh, issue of Man's Life magazine with a great cover painting by an artist named Will Halsey of a guy being attacked by a horde of weasels. And it goes with a story that's actually titled Weasels Rip My Flesh. And you would think that's totally absurd. But in fact, and why, what was one of the things that got Wyatt and I really excited, it's basically a noir style, very noir, dark noir style story, which the protagonist faces this horde of weasels 
and doesn't it doesn't end well for him. Um, and we realize that that the mood of that story was very dark, very noirish. And we went on to find others, not necessarily involving animals, that were also equally uh, dark and noirish. And and it made us realize this is it, it, it this is adult fiction and fantasy uh, for people who liked the kind of things that you would find in noir novels or yeah, in hard boiled or in hard boiled detective novels, which there's sort of an overlap between those two. And that sort of, I think that that goes hand in glove with the sort of the, the with the post-war uh, post-war disillusionment a post or as we said earlier, um, a huge portion of the, of the population um, coming to terms with their war experience um varying degrees of trauma there um but anyway the, the further further subjects uh, that you'll see in in men's adventure magazines a lot um stories about untrustworthy partners whether business partners romantic partners gambling drama uh stories of swindlers con artists schemers of every kind um organized crime heists uh, prostitution human trafficking prison stories uh, hillbilly, redneck, country, exploitation. I mean, like almost all these subjects, they could be presented darkly or, or uh, comically with a lighter touch. And again, we see the cross-pollination between MAMS and movies. So, I mean, you'll see MAMS printing condensed pieces. So prior to the 70s, you'd see MAMS printing condensed pieces by, say, Erskine Caldwell of Tobacco Road fame. Then later, you'd see Deliverance and even Prime Cut inspired pieces deliverance where you've got these sort of country guys that are that are uh, have it in for the city guys and then you've also got uh, in prime cut where you've got the sort of a backwoods uh, mafia situation i mean there are definitely and, motor and motorcycle yeah. gangs and bikers another yeah in the starting in, starting in the mid 60s when biker movies got big b b movie that uh, feature bikers and then easy rider of course which is not b movie but biker movies were big. Men's Adventure magazines followed that trend too, and had a lot of biker stories. And those are those are pretty dark too. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I think there's a lot for for readers of who who appreciate dark fiction, who appreciate noir cinema and noir fiction, and 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 noir iconography, visual iconography. Let's not forget a lot of these illustrators again operating under the direction of of the art directors. Um, they created images that uh, became quite enduring images um, and helped to sort of flesh out uh, a, a different take on noir than the um, than the most conventional. And I'm looking our time is is winding down. So maybe we should open it up to some questions unless there was anything else you wanted to add, Bob. No, just to uh, say that. We have a. One of the next books coming out from us is going to be a, an anthology of uh, stories by Lawrence Block. Um, and, and some of them are pretty noir. Some of them are book bonus versions of his, not like his Tanner series. I don't know if you, any of you are a fan of his Tanner series. Um, but uh, I can't remember the titles of all of them at the at this point. Oh my God! There's so well. We've also we should also mention that we're also prepping uh, one of our most ambitious projects, which is Blue Collar Noir, which is uh, an in-depth look uh, at the noir influences, uh, the noir influence on Mams, and uh, and even some ways that Mams may have uh, influenced some better known noir. So. Uh, yeah, keep an eye, keep an eye on us. Uh, of course, there's the, the Facebook group, um, that, which is extremely popular men's adventure, uh, magazines and books. That is a really, if you're on Facebook, join the group. It's a great forum. People sharing stories, sharing artwork, sharing, uh, per recent purchases, asking questions, comparing notes. It's just a great, really lively group. Um, and yeah, should we go to questions with the, with the remaining time? Uh, yeah, questions are great. Um, well, first, thank you both. That was uh, absolutely in, in, incredible. Um, I have a ton of questions myself, but I know 
Peter has a question and comment. So Peter, if you want to put that in the chat, you're welcome to, or I can try to bring you up, whichever you prefer. All righty. Let's see. If... Did this? Uh, did the slideshow stop? <laughs> I can't tell from my end. Uh, yeah, the slideshow has stopped. Okay, that's fine. Well, I'm gonna try to invite Peter up to the stage. Well, while we're waiting for Peter's question, um, one of my questions is, um how you all do the research for this because there aren't bibliographies for all these words. Oh, Peter's here. Let's, you, you take precedent. I can. Welcome. Thank you. Well, they, I mean, the thing about those adventure series, and I was a big, big Destroyer fan, um, they sort of fall into the, the timeline as they emerged during a paperback boom in the, in the early 70s. Now, keep in mind, that was concurrent with series like Mac Bolan as well, another popular series that, that really has roots in this kind of similar approach to the men's adventure uh, stories. And the reprints of pulp material from that time, the character-driven pulp. So you had Doc Savage paperbacks, you had the Shadow paperbacks, you had the Avenger paperbacks. And it's almost like the um, the Destroyer books and the Mac Bolan books and other series like that that were very, very popular and ran for many, many books. There's a, there's a parallel there to the, to the pulp stuff. I mean, it's a, as I said at the beginning, it's a continuum. So even though that the Destroyer was not did not emerge from men's adventure magazines and men's adventure magazines would never ha have a host a recurring character like that. There is clearly a bond, both in terms of the type of storytelling and in the roots the going all the way back to the pulps. So they're all cousins of a sort, I would say. I was just going to repeat Peter's question. I think there was a tech issue. He was asking about the relationship to uh, books like the destroyer. And of yep, course, just about that. Too, as artists, um, plenty of the artists who work for Men's Adventure magazines, and in the case of somebody like George Gross, artists who go all the way back to the pulps and Men's Adventure magazines, were doing these covers down the road. James Bama, Bob mentioned doing the Doc Savage covers and the Avenger covers. Uh, George Gross did Avenger covers. Uh, so there's definitely a lot of uh, th that's the beauty of this it's like if you if you have an open mind and, and uh, you can you can find something to 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 satisfy you in all of these areas well george gross also did the first 10 uh, mac bolan the executioner covers uh until then after that uh and, and gross did as you saw in that slideshow many many great men's adventure magazine covers he then went on to other paperback series, but Gil Cohen, who was a major men's adventure magazine artist, took, took over as the cover artist for uh, Mac Bolan and uh, the Executioner spinoffs as well. Colin, what was your, you, you had started asking a question. What was your question? Um, oh, Peter, did you, do you want me to take you off of the stage at this moment? Uh, I have nothing more to say. Cool. Thank, well, thank you, you Peter. for coming up. Thanks. So I was interested in how you do research for these books because there's no 
there's not a lot of bibliographies for these stories for the artist and i'm so impressed especially on the facebook page with the attention to who drew this you know illustration who painted this who is the model well for me it started with two groundbreaking books that came out in 2004. Uh, one was called it's a man's world um and and the other was called Men's Adventure Magazines in Post-War America. And those two provide beautifully illustrated books. Um, they, are, they aren't stories, no stories, but they, they, look, it's an, they both provide overviews of the Men's Adventure Magazine genre. And they include um, interviews with a number of, of uh, writers and artists who work for Men's Adventure Magazines, especially the magazine management mags uh, published by Martin Goodman, uh, including uh, our, our friend, you know, who is now, now gone, Bruce J. Friedman, who I got linked up to via Wyatt, whose friend is Josh Allen Friedman, the writer and musician, and Josh's father, Bruce, with the Men's Adventure Magazine editor. And so the, we, we all connected and, and uh, those interviews in those books were done by Josh uh, before all these guys who were magazine management staff passed away. And that, those, that, was, that information was seminal, other information in those books, plus all of the artwork, you know, the covers, cover scans and original artwork. Uh, most, of those most of it in those books came from uh, a collector named Rich Oberg. And once I got in, interested in men's adventure magazines, I contacted Rich and became friends. And the three of us with Wyatt, we all became buddies. And, and Rich um, was a great help in figuring out who the artists were. A lot of times you would see no, there's no credit for who the artists were. And Rich helped us figure out who the artists were. And then uh, since then, uh, you know, over the past 20 years, just done a lot of research online, talked to a lot of the uh, artists and writers, uh, some of them now gone, <laughs> but we sought out the living artists and writers and talked to them. There are a few left. I mean, Gil Cohen is still around, Mark Kunstler is still around in the art realm. Um, some of the writers are still around. There's a writer that I con made contact with not too long ago named Donald Honig who wrote a lot of Western and Civil War novels and then became famous for as a baseball historian of all things, uh, wrote 20 different baseball histories, but he was a regular stringer for Men's Adventure magazines. And I talked to him a lot about how things worked between the artists and writers. Before that, we talked to writers like Robert F. Dorr, who went on to become a military aviation historian and wrote scores of history books. But before that, was a men's adventure magazine writer. Uh, uh, Walter Kalen, we met, yeah, right at the, right. At, I mean, the, the, tra the, the lovely thing and the tragic thing about doing what we do is um, it's it's been a sad trend that we'll get to meet somebody from that world. We'll get to, they'll share their experiences with us. Um, we'll, we'll collaborate on some kind of book project and then we lose them. Just because it's the it's the it's the age the the people from that era there's there's not as many left, so we try to get as much first hand account as many as many first hand accounts as we can, but it's a um, it really is a bit of a race against the clock it feels sometimes because these guys are getting up there you know well and I, and we do a lot of googling there are scattered uh, websites and posts and Facebook pages and so forth that have information that we utilize. There's one of the great resources that some of you may know is the Galactic Central website. Oh yeah. Uh, Philsp, it's P-H-I-L-S-P dot com. Uh, Philsp com, Galactic Central, what a resource. I mean, it's got information about um, vintage magazines uh, and it's the best source of information about vintage magazines on the internet and about who the writers were, the artists, and, and it's really well done. Um, I'm, I'm Phil, there Phil almost Steven, every day. Ah, there you go. Phil Stevenson Payne and his buddies deserve a whole hell of a lot of credit. It's one of the greatest resources on vintage uh, magazines in particular that exists. 
Well, on that note, we just hit the countdown on the clock. So I think we need to wrap this up so the next session can begin. Um, thank you both, sure. Bob and Wyatt, for being here so much. Folks in the audience, head thank to you. Farley's. Um, the books are fantastic um, additions to collections. So anyway, thank you both so thank much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks all.